is happening you guys welcome back to let's go win podcast where we are here to help you be happy healthy wealthy and get better every single day we're going to be talking about leadership we're going to be talking about performance today and we have an expert here that is absolutely going to enlighten us and you know give a lot of her expertise when it comes to navigating the ins and outs of business sonia shelton has seen it all from startups to fortune 500 companies sonia is the ceo of executive leadership consulting where she partners with high growth companies to drive both passionate culture and profitable strategy she's on the forbes count coaches council and is the author of the number one amazon bestseller you're an executive but are you a leader? I think that's a great question straight out of the gate. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Well, me too. And I guess I'll start right away with your title of your book. You're an executive, but are you a leader? I don't think this question probably gets asked enough because there is a distinguishing, there's a big di distinguishing factor between are you an executive that's a title versus being a leader, but that's just my opinion. How did you choose the title of your book? I, I came up with it from my own experience as a leader and, and kind of seeing working with various companies and various levels in companies and seeing how different people would use the strength of their title to try to motivate people um, in a very fear-based compliance kind of way. And then other people would really step forward and setting a, a purpose and a vision and pull people along. Like they they wanted to come along and follow. And, and I really wanted to almost, you know, people in executive positions think they have it covered and maybe a little buttoned up and wanted to just hit them in the face with the title, to be honest, and say, you know, be a little bit provocative and say, you know, it isn't the same. It isn't the same. If you have an executive title, they're not necessarily, you're not necessarily leading. Are we improving in this regard? Is this something, uh, the years of yesteryear that the nineties, I think of these titles where people really, well, this is my title and you'll listen. And uh, to a degree, we fell in line are we improving on this idea where, hey, just because you have a title does not make you a leader or are we regressing? What are you seeing out in the market today? I'm seeing a mix. I think that there are companies who recognize what's happening with, you know, there, there still is a talent shortage of good talent and to how, what they need to do to be able to retain talent. They're focused on that. Like how, how can we attract the, the best people? How can we develop those people to become leaders themselves? You know, they're really focused on that. How can we create a purpose that really brings people in and, and wants to work for this company? And, I, and it's interesting because I saw a little bit of a trend during the great resignation where companies were, were very much, and, and business owners particularly, were very much looking at how, you know, almost panicking. Like, how do we keep our people? How do we get the right people? Because they're leaving for companies that can pay them more. Um, you know, they're making these choices and, and we feel like we're kind of left in the dust in this great re resignation. And they were really focused on, on trying to become better leaders. And then I saw this shift where as things started to open up and, um, you know, bigger companies were doing layoffs and there's more people available where business owners were starting to say, hmm, I actually don't need to focus on this anymore because the power is back to us, right? And 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 I think they want to be, you know, if, if I talk to them, they want to be that leader. They, they want to care about it. But when it comes to actually doing the work, not always doing the work. Is it a matter of not knowing how to get this? Because it's interesting. You said talent shortage, and I have two questions specific to this, but is it the fact that we don't really teach this stuff, right? We don't really teach leadership, in my opinion. It's kind of a, well, you did well, now we promoted you. You did well, we promoted you. Cool, you're a leader now. Go get them, Tiger. Whereas this isn't being taught in most schools. I don't see leadership 
being taught. Let's just start in high school and then maybe you sprinkle it in in college if your focus is in specific organizational leadership or leadership. But is it that or do they have the tools and it's like, well, I, I, you know, what is it? Why, why aren't we leadership is so important. And yet it, the theme around the country, not just only in companies is that we are failing in large part due to leadership. So where have we missed the boat? Sonia, what's going on here? I, there's gotta be, we, we missed it somewhere along the way. Yes, I do. I do think education um, could contribute significantly. And I, and I think there's also you know, just shifts in culture about, um, you know, how sports are played, how, you know, how kids are are acknowledged as, as leaders or not acknowledged as leaders, particularly women, right? I think there's been a shift for women, but I think there's still some res residue there. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think there is a skill, a skill set that's missing. And then I also think that companies aren't necessarily prioritizing it. Right. So, so are, is this, do they really get the benefit or are they still seeing it as the soft stuff? Right. Um, that the, and, and, and that's where, where we really focus is on this connection between leadership and culture and business strategy. And I, so I think so, some of it is in, in my industry, not necessarily making those business connections for leaders to say, how, how do you, how do you make this a business case, right? To say, why is leadership important? What can it do for your organization? So not, not only do I think that there's a skill gap, I think there's also an, an understanding gap of what leadership and culture can really do for your business, that it's not a nice to have. It can really be a game changer in your business if it's aligned to your business strategy. Yeah, and she was using air quotes when she used soft skills. And it is an interesting term. I, I cannot stand it because... It is, you hear it all the time. You're, what you're saying is absolutely accurate. They call them soft skills when it's actually having real conversations with people, genuinely caring about someone else on your team. To me, that doesn't sound soft. That sounds like, okay, these are retention. It's going to save your company a ton of money. Why, how did soft skills ever even come where did that come from? Where where do we say these are soft? Because the truth is, I see most leaders avoid these conversations because that's hard. That's real work. But yet we're going to say, no, nah, I'm just not good at the soft skills. So I'm really good at you know my strategy, which I know we're going to talk about marrying culture and strategy together, which I think is really important. But where do we start saying soft skills? Where the hell did that come from? I, know, I, I can't tell you from a research-based answer, but I can give you my theory on it, which is the kind of, if you look back decades, it wasn't really okay to bring yourself to work. There was your, who you were at outside of work, and then there, who you were supposed to be at work. And I see, I've seen this over the years in my career to go exponentially up with people in executive positions, right? Like, like, um, like I call it buttoned up leadership. Like they're, they, they're all, they have to pretend that they're all buttoned up no matter how things are crashing around them or all of the stress that they're dealing with or the challenges that companies are facing, they act like they have it together. And that sets this, this um, differential between them and everyone else. So they're not accessible. They're not authentic. People can feel when you're pretending they can feel it. Right. So, so I, I do think that that has changed where, where, you know, may, maybe that idea of soft skills came with, with the emotional side. Right. And, and that it's, it's the logic and the business and the bottom line, and that's the hard stuff and, and what we deliver, whether it's service or products, that's the, that's the hard stuff. And this emotion stuff that I'm not really comfortable because I actually have to show who I am um, is the soft stuff. Right. <laughs> right. And, and I worked with a client, it was a number of years ago. Um, and he, he was very much like that, like we, very buttoned up. Um, he, he was actually quite an emotional person, but he didn't like, he had no nonverbal communication. Like it was very straight, um, you know, face was very calm all the time. And then he would, he would tell these stories to his team. He loved to read, he loved history and he would 
make these analogies to historic figures and try to be inspiring and and people would be like there's a disconnect here like he's he's saying these stories but we don't really believe him and those stories were authentically who he was but because of how he was trying to show up and always sort of being being stoic and not having any emotion people couldn't connect with him and and so when i worked with him it was is around just breaking those walls down and allowing him to show up as him and and then he was able to connect and people wanted actually wanted to work with him and wanted to follow him more when he showed up as his authentic self you know what's so funny is because if you if you say it aloud hey if i'm going to be fake people will follow me or if i'm going to be real people will follow me it's it's a simple like people don't follow fake they just long term and you mentioned vision earlier like having that real vision I, one of the most important things a leader does is to create a vision so big that everyone else's vision can fit inside of it but that's going to require you to be real not fake so when you actually say it aloud it's like well of course but because of this idea and i was this way for years guys just so we're clear i was that buttoned up guy that said the exact thing had to look a certain way had to know all the answers it's all bullshit. That's not the way the world works, but it is kind of our understanding of what a leader should be. Is that because what we're seeing on TV? Is that because what we're seeing in leadership and politics is I can't really be myself because they're, I'm just going to get destroyed. But isn't that really where we need to go to have true influence for people to follow us? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that there's also this dynamic of human nature to put people in authority on a pedestal, whether they want to be there or not, right? And to and so I have empathy for for leaders in this in these situations where where they where they're always being watched. I tell I tell my clients they have they always have their own personal paparazzi following them around. And whenever they see anything that doesn't when your walk is not matching their talk, your talk, it spreads like wildfire. And I had I had this happen in an organization that I was working with. The CEO was really passionate about safety. He, it was a manufacturing company. The the role that he had before somebody lost their life in the factory, and it really hit him hard. And he just made it his number one thing that will never happen again on my watch. Safety is the number one thing. And at their headquarters. They, they took it to, you know, you have to walk around. If you have coffee, you have to walk around with a lid, soup, walk around with a lid, can't walk, can't walk around looking at your cell phone. You can't walk in and look at the cell phone, you know, can't drive with while you're talking on the phone, all these, all these rules about safety. And um, now take, keep in mind, I did not work there. I was a consultant and I wasn't there when it happened. And he went to the cafeteria for lunch and he got his soup and did not put a lid on it. It took 10 minutes for me to hear about it. I wasn't even an employee. 10 minutes, right? And so it was just so eye-opening for me to see, to see like, wow, this paparazzi idea is real, <laughs> right? Like that really happens. And and leaders don't always think about that. Like they're just going through their day. They're, you know, he was just, he just forgot. Like it wasn't, it wasn't intentional. He wasn't anything, right? But um they're always looking at what you're doing and dissecting what you're doing and putting you up on this pedestal. And I think sometimes leaders think they need to live up to that. And I think that's part of where this being buttoned up can come from as well. It's like, well, they're expecting me to be this way. And so I'm going to be this way, even though that's not really me. And it's, it's really sort of fighting that tendency of their expectations of where to put you on that pedestal and bringing it back down to say, we're, you know, I'm, I have this role, you know, I have this leadership role, but that doesn't make me a better person than you, right? Um, we just have different roles in the organization, right? So, so really trying to remind people of that. And I think when you're authentic and when you're vulnerable as a leader, you don't have to say it. People just know. It's like, oh yeah, you're a human, <laughs> right? Like, oh, okay, I get it, right? How was his response? I'm curious because I think he has an opportunity here, right? He He's clearly set out to have a policy and the policy was good, which I think any policy created, it starts with a good idea. I'm not saying that his was a bad one. I'm curious how his response was to 
the criticism or the scuttlebutt that he didn't put the lid on his coffee. Did he own it and say, look, I'm fallible. I didn't think about it. Or did he say, you know what? That's not for me. That's for everyone else. How, how did, did he own it? Yeah, he absolutely owned it. And, and he, um, and it, and it was about, you know, he, he wanted people to be accountable, right. That we all make, we're going to make mistakes, but we, we want to keep this front of mind and keep it, um, you know, appreciate you holding me accountable too, right? Like we need to hold each other accountable because sometimes we forget. I want to get to this topic and I'm just going to read the question because honestly, I, it, the way it's written is really good because I, I can't really meld them together. So I'm just going to ask it. Culture doesn't eat strategy for breakfast. They have breakfast together. Striking the right balance between strategy and culture. Now, culture has become, I would say, over the last 10 to 15 years, a buzzword in in business. And I say it, I don't know how many times a day, but it's probably approaching you know 50 a day. I mean, I say the word culture a ton. It's a huge part of my life. But what you're saying is you have to have both in order to succeed. Are companies doing this? Are they really saying, because I see companies that nail strategy, but rarely do I see people get that culture piece correct. So how do people start to bring these things to, together so they're at the breakfast table eating together and not cultures destroying strategy and vice versa? Yeah, so th so this, this came from the Peter Drucker quote, um, culture eat strategy for breakfast, which I always used to say, right? And what I started noticing over the, over the, I'd say over the past maybe 10, 15 years, there were some companies that were taking culture to the extreme, to the expense of strategy, right? We want this to be a great place to work. We're going to spend all this money. And, and I think more in the startup world, right? <laughs> Or it's like we want we want it to be fun to work here. We're gonna do all these things for the employees, but we don't really have the money, right? And so um, they were doing it at the expense of the business, and and it really made me reflect on this idea of culture eat strategy for breakfast because that's they owned that. They were like, I believe that we're gonna show that that's true, <laughs> but they kind of lost the business strategy part of it in the process. And then, like you're saying, there's other companies that are really focused on strategy and culture takes the back seat. And where I really see them come together is that your culture can support your business strategy. And when you change your business strategy, when you change your vision, when you get more clear about your purpose, your culture needs to change to align to those things, to make them happen. And so it's not about, and I also think there's a, there's a confusion about what culture really is, right? So some people think, you know, it's the parties, it's um, how we how we come together and how we have fun together. And those are absolutely part of it. But culture is your strategy. Culture is who you hire, why you hire them. Culture is who do you promote and why you promote them. Culture is, is, is involved in your processes. Culture is involved in your structure. Um, culture is involved in you know, how people, how, how you come up with goals and how those goals are measured. All of that is part of your culture. It's part of communication is part of your culture, right? So um, I think a lot of companies don't really recognize what culture is. And so they're, they're trying to bring all these things in. And I see a lot of companies trying to do like nice things for the employees and, um, and do things to have fun but all the other parts of the of what I define as culture are broken. And so it just feels, it falls flat. It doesn't, people aren't really engaged. They're not having fun. It feels like awkward, right? <laughs> right, right. And, um, and so it, it's, it's because the company doesn't understand what culture really is. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I, I do see it. I love what you said. Culture is a part of strategy. Culture is your strategy. It's like they they don't, it's not a war here, guys. It's not like strategy be damned. We're just going to be singing Kumbaya and circle. Well, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. You have to go sell your gadget or whatever that strategy is. Um, you mentioned communication. I find that whether it's the policy that we talked about earlier with the safety, that the communication piece is where this all starts to fall apart. So some executives get in a room, maybe they bring in a consultant like, your, like yourself, 
and they they get it down and it's awesome it looks beautiful on this piece of paper or this mission statement on a wall and then we don't do anything with it so when they bring you in and you get them dialed in on culture on strategy how do we go about getting this communication piece whether it's cascading communication communication from the bottom to the top top to the bottom what do you suggest sonia because i think people want their company to be the very best but i think it's this communication piece where it's just like oh, well, we put it up on the wall they didn't follow it so i guess it's just not going to work no dude this is something that you need to talk about a lot this is part of your culture is constantly reminding so what are your thoughts on communicating whether it's a strategy the culture of the performance the goals what does that communication piece look like you know, when I work with leaders on communication and communication is my background, so I'm really passionate about it. And when I worked in communications, I think they were saying you needed, um, you know, between eight and 10 touch points in, in internal communications before people really get it. You have to say the same thing between eight and 10 times for them to really get it. That number has gone up, I think, to about 20 mm. because we have so much information coming at us on a daily basis, right? From email, social media, advertising, you know, television, like all these things that are coming at us, everything on the internet, right? Like how, how many things are on one screen just when you're on one website, right? All of these, this information coming at us, we, as our brains can't retain all that, right? So we need this repetition, but it's not just saying the same thing over and over. So, uh, and one of the things that I, that I do with leaders to show them so is as I say, you know, how many times have you seen a penny? So how many times do you think you've seen a penny? You're asking me in my lifetime, how many times I've seen a penny? Um, I, I don't know. So I probably have seen a million pennies in my life. I don't know. Right, right. And then I have it. So I said, okay, so you've seen at least a million times. Most people say the same thing. Millions of times. Draw one. And I have I, them draw it. Okay. And no one ever gets it right. They get it kind of, and then they, you know, if, if, and I've also had teams do it together, I'll have individuals do it. I'll have teams do it depending on the size of the group. And if it's a team doing it, they're arguing about it. And they, and it's like, they, they, so if we've seen a penny a million times and we actually, we've looked at it, but we, we haven't really, we can't really repeat it and say what this looks like when we've seen it that many times, hmm. it kind of just lands about communications. And so when I work with with leaders on communication, it is about, first of all, making sure that your communication is clear. Do people understand what you're trying to say? Um, do they understand the purpose of the company? Do they understand the vision of the company? And, and one of the tricks that I use is I'll ask, I'll ask just five random people in a company. So what do you think the purpose and the vision of the company is? And then I see what they say. And it's okay if they don't say it word for word. If they get the gist of it and they say it in their own words, then I know they've got it, right? But if, in fact, if they say it in the, their own words, they really have it because now they own it. If they're just repeating, the, if they're just repeating something memorized, they, have, they don't really own it, right? So um, in all the years that I've been doing this, it's only happened one time where I had five people actually tell me um, what it was. And it was a school district, mm. but the, the most companies that the, the people don't know. And so when I work with leaders, it's not about making sure that you're repeating it over and over, but it's looking for opportunities to bring it back, especially on the purpose and vision. When you're acknowledging somebody for a job well done, connect it back to the purpose and the vision, right? So how they're contributing, how this thing that they did such a good job on is contributing to the purpose and the vision. You're talking about a new initiative that's coming up that you're working on. How does that contribute to the purpose and the vision? And so everything that you're doing as a company is coming back to that. Why we're here in that purpose or mission and where we're going in that vision. You're, you're giving them mile markers along the way. Yes, we're on track. Yes, we're still on the path. We're on the road to where we're going and this is another step. And this is really important to me because um, there's also a really big increase in burnout in organizations today. And as I've looked at the research and, and talked to our own clients, 
a lot of it has to do with this lack of purpose and lack of clarity. So people are not really sure why they're doing what they're doing. And they feel almost like they're running on a treadmill. So they're really, really busy and they're getting things done. But because things are moving so fast, we're not taking time to celebrate those things that we're getting done. So now it feels like I'm on a treadmill going nowhere. And that's going to lead to burnout. When you have purpose, a purpose for what you're doing, and you have a destination of where you're going, it doesn't feel like stress. It feels like passion, right? And and that's what we call culture. We call culture passion, right? Are they passionate about the purpose of the company? Are they passionate about their role in fulfilling that purpose and, and achieving that vision? And then that's where burnout goes away because I'm not, it's not about me just running and running and not ever accomplishing anything. It's I can see that we're making progress. I can, it's, it matters to me that we make progress. And when I see organizations that get that right, their people exponentially grow beyond what they thought was possible, um, what they could do in their company. And they come up with ideas that never would have been thought of. When you have people that are passionate about your purpose and that engaged, they will they will do it for you. Like they they will take you down down the road to your vision faster than than you even thought was possible, uh, because they'll come up with ideas you couldn't. Yeah, a running on a treadmill with no end in sight sounds awful, and it's a really good analogy. I love that. Uh, not I don't love it. Like feels good, but I mean it makes a ton of sense. I want to ask on the school district because I'm guessing you've worked with hundreds or thousands of companies and you said one one that you've seen in your entirety throughout where you had five people could literally not recite but truly knew the vision the purpose where we're going my question is what did they do so well in order to do that was it repetition was it encourage and praise and recognize for a job well done when people do things well, was it, you know, we, we, we talk about it every staff meeting, what did they do well? Because that's what I want to figure out because I, it's not a punishment. Or it's not a, even a judgment on the other 999, let's say of a thousand that didn't have it, but what did they do so well? So we can model it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think they, they have a, a little bit of an advantage being a school district because they're, mission was very clear. Their purpose was very clear and they were all passionate about it. Right. So, so their, their principles of schools, they, they were, they're passionate about their work. Right. And um, so, so they, they had a little bit of an advantage there. The vision of, of what they did was actually created by the team. So they, they brought people together. They brought different levels of people together. So not just the principals, but also, you know, teachers and administrators, and, and they were all involved in creating what that vision would be. And so they owned it because they were part of building it. Right. And, and, and that's what we do with organizations when we work with them on creating vision is, is really enrolling as many people, not just the leadership team in creating it. That doesn't mean that they're going to be making the decisions, but they have input and they remember that, right? And they have a sense of, of pride of ownership when they're part of it. And then they can remember it because they were part of creating it. So I, I think that was one thing that they did really well. Um, they also invested in their leaders, right? So, so I came in as part of their leadership retreat. And when I did asking the questions was, um, I joined them for lunch before, before I did my speaking engagement and just was randomly asking people at lunch as I was meeting them. And then I talked about it when, when I spoke with them that afternoon that, you know, how impressed I was and some of the things that they were doing were saying was, well, we're investing in our leadership. We're having retreats like this, where we're coming together, we're talking about it. We're, we're saying, you know, how do we move this vision forward together? What's not working? How can, how can we fix those things? Right. So they're, they're, really focused on it and making sure that their leaders are supported and making it happen. Yeah. And as you're talking, I'm thinking of like undercover boss or going back to the guy with the, the lid and the soup. We lose touch quickly from when we do work in executive to, let's say if it's a manufacturing plant to the floor, 
And so when you bring in, and I'm talking to every executive out here right now, when you bring people in, the the people that are working on the floor are truly out in the field, you're getting that level of perspective that you just can't have as an executive. I think this is such an important point as you get clarity on your goals for the year, on your culture of your company, on the vision. Don't be afraid to to bring them in because the truth is you're going to get true perspective. You're going to really know what's happening. I think that's brilliant. I want to ask on red thread leadership, the five P formula to grow as fast as your ambition. I love the word ambition. In fact, I was just on a college campus tour with my son and their whole mantra is we are the ambitious. So I love this and I want people to hear what this five P formula is all about because we all have big goals and dreams, but somewhere along the line, we mess up. So what's the five P formula all about? Yes. And, and, and I think this came from me listening to executives and business owners talking about frustration with their people. Like I have this ambition of what I can, I see what we can do, what we can create, and they're not helping me. <laughs> right. And, um, and so, so I do think that that's a common complaint with with a lot of leaders is that they they just can't get everybody moving in the same direction. And so, so I came up with Red Thread Leadership, really out of kind of seeing where the trends were going with the younger generation, really being focused on purpose, and not just purpose in where they decide they're going to work, but purpose in how they decide what they're going to buy. So it doesn't matter <laughs> what you what you sell. They're going to, if they feel like they're connected with your company purpose, they'll spend more to to go with your company or your brand than they would another one because they believe in you. And I saw where this could go. And I said, you know, companies really need to focus on purpose, both both on their on their company brand as well as their their employer brand. So how can I help them with that, right? And and really start created red thread is is taking your purpose and running that red thread of your purpose through everything that you do in your culture. So the first P is purpose, and and it it goes through the whole thing. The second P is plan. Your plan is your vision, your strategy, and your goals. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And then once you have your plan, then we look at your processes. So that's the third P. How, how do we need to change or realign our processes to our purpose and our plan? And then how can we empower our team to ask that question on a regular basis? Why, are, why am I doing this process? Is this process getting us where we want to go? Or do could it be improved? Do we need to get rid of it? Um, and I think a, a lot of people, a lot of leaders will spend time on the purpose and the, and the plan, but not necessarily go to the level of the process. And so it it goes a little bit slower when when you don't really analyze your processes and say how can we streamline to get us there faster and stop doing the things that aren't going to get us there and then the fourth p is your positions so this is how you're structured um your organization design um how, who you hire and why how you promote how you reward um how decisions are made this is all part of positions and then the fifth p is passion which is around um, developing this passion. This is where leadership falls in. Alignment, communications. Are people passionate for the company? Uh, passionate about the company? Do they understand their role in the purpose? Do they are they passionate about their role in it? And then, do they have trust in the organization? And do they have trust in each other? That's awesome. Why the red thread? What is there? Why red thread? Out of curiosity. Yeah, so the, so there's a few different reasons. Um, one is in in Asia, there's this um, idea that there's an invisible thread that goes from your heart through your hand to the people that you're meant to make history with. And I just love this concept of, um, to me, that's work. Like that's business. That's you know, it's like it starts with that the passion of the heart from the the founder of the company who came up with this idea to getting people involved in, in creating this idea and then maybe creating a bigger company. Maybe that founder is not around anymore, but that, that heart still continues and the hand is the work itself. 
and then continuing that thread to each other um, to make that happen and continue to to make it happen. Awesome. If you were to tell leaders right now, you're like, look, I wish every leader had this attribute or attributes where you want to be the most dynamic leader that people truly want to follow through that brick wall. You built the vision, but what are those attributes that they truly have? And I have my own thoughts, but I'm really curious when you boil it down, like the one to three attributes that you're like, come on leaders, let's go work on these skills. What, what are those? Yeah, I think it's authentic presence. So are you with people? Are you really, or are you somewhere else when you're talking to them? Um, I think this is, I, I would say my number one thing that I've developed as a leader is, is to really just be a hundred percent present with whoever's in front of me on my team. And, and I will see things in their nonverbal communications or hear things in their nonverbal communications if I'm really present what, to get to what are they not saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's a, a really great skill. I think it is this connecting to um, being, a, being able to start with why, with the purpose and, and being able to communicate that in a way that people are excited about it. And then, and being able to have that long-term vision and being willing to be agile on your way, right? So that you're going to achieve this vision, but things are changing all the time. And how can we, um, how can we be flexible and not really stay so married to our ideas of how it's going to happen, but take what's happening and say, okay, we still have our, our vision of where we want to go, but maybe how we're going to get there needs to change. Um, and being able to have that flexibility and agility to, to get there. Yeah, you mentioned start with why. I'm guessing Cynic as maybe somebody you've read as well. Is there anyone else if you're like, you know what? This is a really good leadership book that I wish everyone, of course, you're an executive, but are you a leader? We got to get that one for sure. But is there any other leadership books where you're like, yeah, man, they nailed it? Yeah, I think one of my favorites is John Maxwell. I don't think I can pick one of his books, <laughs> but I think I think he and I are very much aligned. And, and he does bring this concept of the results and the leadership culture together. Yeah, he's got amazing. I, I would have to pick probably 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership would, if I had to take one of John's. That's probably it. Uh, this is just open forum. I'm sure there's a question. I just didn't know enough to ask you, Sonia. And you're like, JM, come on, man. We got to <laughs> let the audience know. This is your open forum moment. Anything I didn't know enough to ask you where before we kind of wrap this up, you want to make sure to share with the audience. Yeah, I think I, I that idea of starting with why, that's our, our first step in how we work with any level of an organization, whether that's an individual leader with executive coaching or working with a team or working with the whole the whole company culture, is this idea of starting with why. Why do you do what you do? How do you deliver on that why? And then what can others expect from you? And so that's one of the things that we really we really focus on defining that and getting clarity about that and then that connecting to your purpose so when you do that as a leader for your individual why how and what right then that connects you to what you're doing with your team and when you know that as a team that connects you to what you're doing as a company so I, so I just want to reiterate this this concept of of agreeing with Simon and starting with why you know, what's interesting is it always does come back to these really, and I mean this as a compliment. I could ask you about leadership all day long. I'm passionate about it. But if my listeners were like, yes, I need Sonia in my life. 
this is, I, I need to reach out to her. What's the best way for the audience to connect with you? I think the, the best way is to come to our website, executiveleader.com. And it has um, every, everything that I just talked about. We have free webinars on Red Thread Leadership. We have tools on how to connect with your why and how to discover your why. Um, lots of free resources on articles and, and other downloadable resources that you can get, as well as a link to the book. So that's a one-stop shop. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn from the website. So that so I would say executiveleader.com. Go check it out, you guys. I mean, look, she she said all these companies, I saw one that nailed it. So we all, all of us, we can use this in our life. I promise you what she's talking about. She will help grow your company. It's just the way it is. So Sonia, you're awesome. I really appreciate you coming, sharing your wisdom and and just, yeah, I'd love this idea of the the red leader, the red thread leadership. Uh, the fact that strategy and culture, they, they, they don't, they're not at odds. They are actually working together. So thank you for bringing that all to the table today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation. It's truly my pleasure. I mean, guys, look, one out of how many companies I didn't ask the exact number and it doesn't matter. The point is only one really nailed it. We all can spend time on this. And if you're listening Think about your company and think, how can we grow? How can we have more fulfillment and pleasure and have this culture of fun? And it's it's available to us. Ask some basic questions. Go grab the book. Check it out. Share this with someone you know that maybe their culture is suffering. Maybe that their company is not operating at the highest level. Because I promise you what Sonia talked about today absolutely can help you do that. Until the next time, remember your mindset matters. I appreciate you all. We'll talk soon.